the pleasure and the great honor to introduce to you the next plenary speaker. It's Giovanni Paolo Galdi. Giovanni Galdi is a Leeton and Mary Orr Professor of Engineering and also Professor of Mathematics at the University of Pittsburgh. Moreover, he is Honorary Professor at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Mumbai and also of the Department of Mathematics at the Technical University of Darmstadt. Professor Galdi earned his laurea degree from the University of Napoli in 71 in, in general physics, and actually that might be a little bit surprising, uh, his education at that stage was essentially uh, experimental, and his thesis was, was a work on the Josephson effect. Uh, after that, he recognized that his real vocation was mathematics and its use towards a rigorous explanation and interpretation of physical phenomena. So <clears throat> he worked as a postdoc in mathematics at the University of Naples from 1972 to 1976, and further also uh, in mathematics and as well as in aerospace engineering and mechanics at the University of Minnesota. Uh, in 1980, he became professor at the Department of Mathematics of the University of Naples, where he stayed for uh, five years. Thereafter, he moved to the University of Ferrara, where he was professor at the Institute of Engineering. And in 1989, he founded the School of Engineering there in Ferrara and managed this school as a dean from 1989 to 1995. It was in 1999 when he joined the faculty at the University of Pe Pittsburgh. Um, after that, in the years uh, from 2003 to 2009, he spent uh, quite some time in Germany, and this was made possible by the uh, Mercator guest professorship from DFG, which was awarded to him. He has been visiting professor in, at many institutions Institutions are in Glasgow, are University of Minnesota, University of Paderborn, RWTH Aachen, University of Pretoria, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Bangalore, Fudan University in Shanghai, Waseda University in Tokyo, Czech Academy of Sciences, Streklov Institute of Mathematics in St. Petersburg, University of uh, Paris in Orsay, and uh, Instituto Superior Tecnico in Lisbon, as well as University of Pisa. Professor Galdi is a member of several editorial boards of scientific journals. Uh, actually, he's co-founder and editor-in-chief of the well-known Journal of Mathematical Fluid Mechanics. Uh, he serves at the editorial board of European Journal of Mechanics B, the Advances in Mathematical Fluid Mechanics, the Birkhäuser uh, series and also on the editorial board of Contemporary Challenges in Mathematical Fluid Mechanics, which is a publication of World Scientific. Professor Galdi's current area of research are fourfold. He is interested in liquid-solid interaction, in particular uh, in the equilibrium configuration of uh, an elastic solid in the flow of a Navier-Stokes liquid, as well as uh, in self-propelled motion of bodies in viscous and viscoelastic liquids. Another field of interest is bifurcation and stability, where he's particularly interested in the steady-state bifurcations of uh, solutions to the Navier-Stokes equations for the flow past an obstacle and related stability problems. Furthermore, he is interested in asymptotic dynamics, in particular the long-time behavior of solutions to the Navier-Stokes equations for the flow past obstacles and also uh, control of this flow by parameter variations or by different parameters. Last not least, he is interested in generalized Newtonian models for the flow past the cylinder and uh, the flow in curved pipes of shear thinning, non-Newtonian liquids, with applications to hemodynamics. Professor Galdi has co-authored more than 150 papers. Uh, he has written six books and co-edited 16 books. Most noteworthy, I think, 
uh, is his two-volume book, An Introduction to the Mathematical Theory of the Navier-Stokes Equations, which was published in Springer, and has since then, since 1994, become a classic milestone in the steady-state theory of the Navier-Stokes Equations. Today, Professor Galdi will give his plenary lecture on the motion of a rigid, uh, of a rigid body with a liquid-filled cavity, and um, I'm looking forward to a very interesting lecture. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Kuhlman, again, for this very nice and detailed introduction. I learned things that, uh, from you that I didn't know myself about me. So thanks a lot. It was very, very interesting and, uh, uh, and uh, knowledgeable. Uh, of course, uh, it is a great pleasure and honor to be here and uh, to be invited by the GAM. And uh, I would like to thank, in the person of, uh, of Professor Hillers, this, uh, uh, for this invitation as well as I would like to thank the local organizers, uh, who I'm sure they did, I mean, you can tell, uh, did a lot of work and uh, the work was perfect. So Professor Zavarista, Professor Campisi, Campiti, <laughs> I know him for a while, <laughs> sorry, Michele, Campiti, of course, Campiti, not Campisi. I was, you know, uh, and, uh, uh, and of course, b being back in Lecce uh, is one of my favorite towns in, uh, in Italy. So, <clears throat> so the topic of my uh, uh, talk will be on the motion of a body with a liquid field cavity. So now this problem can be basically embedded uh, in a much more general context, which is the interaction of uh, fluid and solids. This is a particular case. And uh, the, uh, the, the special, you know, as you may know, uh, interaction of fluids and solids, uh, uh, elastic solids with liquids, viscous or non-viscous, <laughs> Uh, even though it has been studied for a long time, especially by engineers, for obvious reasons, things like airplanes, uh, but from the mathematical point of view, a consistent study and, and a kind of uh, uh, rigorous study has been started only lately. I would fix, uh, let's say, uh, 20 years, uh, the time where these problems were really analyzed uh, with uh, uh, mathematical rigor. So uh, this is, uh, let's say, a new topic in the sense that it's very old uh, from the experimental point of view. We'll come back on that. But from the rigorous mathematical point of view, it's basically an unexplored territory. So this, is, uh, uh, this, this lecture is dedicated to present some of these problems and uh, how interesting, in principle, they are and uh, how they can involve uh, not only rigorous mathematical analysis, but nice experiments and uh, nice numerics. So since I have a joint appointment, as Professor Kuhlman pointed out, in engineering and in mathematics, I have to make also my living in the engineering uh, department. And so my work, uh, I like when my work is applied on problems uh, that are appreciated also by engineers. I start with a very simple situation. You just take a, a stone and uh, just throw it in the air. In fact, this is a real picture of a stone in my backyard. So, uh, if you throw it in the air, uh, of course under the action of gravity, everybody knows that uh, uh, what happens is the, is the center of mass will describe, of course, assume that there is no air, so the center of mass will describe an arc, right, a parabola, an arc of parabola, in an inertial frame, let's say, in a frame where we are disregarding other forces, I mean all forces other than gravity. Okay, so now uh, we are interested in the motion about uh, the center of mass. So what does it mean uh, interested in the motion about the center of mass? Well, in a frame that I called F, with the origin at the center of mass of the stone, and the axes that are oriented, uh, uh, they preserve the same orientation with respect to the axis of the inertial frame, okay? So now, everybody in this audience says, well, we know this thing very well, why do you waste your time? Well because we'll be interested what uh, will happen next. So, first of all, let's just uh, review this very simple case. So, if I want to study the motion of that uh, stone around the center of mass, what I do, I just write uh, the conservation of angular momentum, okay? In, because, of course, the gravity doesn't exert any uh, torque around the center of mass. So, I just write uh, the very simple conservation of angular momentum. 
So kg is the angular momentum around the, the center of mass, and I can write it as the inertia tensor times uh, the angular velocity. So this is, this is absolutely clear. So uh, even if it is, it is clear, if we're really interested in the motion, uh, we should a little bit uh, uh, not modify by write the other equations in a different way. And so this was done by Euler a uh, long time ago. So what we do, instead of studying those equations from uh, an inertial point of view, an inertial, uh, inertial system point of view, we like to project those equations, to, not to project, but to write those equations in a frame that is attached to the body. Okay, so in a body fixed. And therefore, the equations, if we make a simple uh, transformation uh, that, of course, involves uh, the angular velocity, we end, up, we end up with this equation that is written at the bottom of the, uh, of the slide, and these are the famous Euler equations in a scalar form or Euler equation in a vector form. Okay, so now all these quantities have been transformed. Okay, so now, very briefly, let's review the solutions to this system of equations. They are very well known, of course, but let's review them for the sake. Okay, so the simplest case is a permanent rotation. So steady state, there is no time involved, so the solution is very simple. Uh, we are looking for solutions where omega is a constant, little omega, omega little omega is the the angular velocity in the body fixed frame, but since it's a constant, also the, let's say, the real angular velocity with respect to inertial frame has to be a constant, and in fact they are equivalent. And then from the Euler equation, we see that these permanent rotations can happen if and only if the angular velocity is directed along one of the eigenvectors of the inertia tensors, tensor. And so these eigenvectors are the direction of the central axis of inertia. Okay, so that's the very simple situation that a steady state has to be a permanent rotation. Okay, so now regular precessions, this is something also that is very known to everyone, right? I mean, if the body has a little symmetry, mass symmetry, like a, a spin, uh, like a top spin, or like a cylinder, okay? then we know that the most general motion has to be uh, a steady precession. So in other words, the body rotates around uh, an axis of inertia uh, that is fixed in the body, uh, while the same axis of inertia rotates around the direction of the constant angular momentum. So this is also a very simple motion. Now what happens in general when we have no symmetry, and we are looking for unsteady situations, unsteady motions. Well, uh, the general motion is then more complicated. This is called uh, uh, motion a la Poinceau. It's a very classical, uh, you know, uh, class of motions that you can study on any elementary book in mechanics. And uh, uh, therefore, if you have no symmetry at all, you're expecting that the motion is and unsteady, the motion is complicated. So we can conclude that if we throw this stone in the air, we know perfectly what happens to the center of mass, describes an arc or parabola, and that the motion around the center of mass is going to be a complicated motion. So I think that we can give this for granted. Okay, so now let's do the following, and here where you know, the interesting thing comes into play, or at least starts coming into play. So suppose that we have now the same body, and ideally, because it's difficult to do, but we make a, a we perform a hollow cavity completely contained in, inside the stone. If that is difficult to imagine, think of a bottle, and, which already has, of course, an internal cavity, and, you know, cork it at the top, okay? And now, what do we do? We fill this cavity with a viscous liquid. Completely, entirely, that's the most important thing, that this cavity is completely filled with a viscous liquid. So, in other words, things that I, will, that I will say will not necessarily be true, either if the cavity is not completely filled or if the liquid is not viscous. Okay, so we do this, so think of the bottle instead of the stone, if that is difficult to imagine. Think of the bottle and we fill it up with some viscous liquid going from water to wine, you choose. Okay, so now this is what happens. And this was very well known experimentally for a long, long time. So the motion of the coupled system now 
which is liquid plus stone, around the center of mass of S, so the general, the general, the center of mass of the couple system, well, can change dramatically. And what you obtain that uh, the what you are expecting is that the motion of the body will be completely stabilized. And we will see in which way. So even though you think of a, a little drop of water inside the body, mathematically speaking, of course, uh, you know, engineering or physically speaking is different, but mathematically speaking, you will find a stabilization. And so we would like to understand what this is stabilization. Okay, so, uh, just a word about the applications. That's why these things are very well known, have been very well known for a long time. So the applications are space engineering. So re-entry of space rafts and rockets in the Earth's atmosphere, stabilization of satellites. They do this all the time, and the liquid sometimes is even water, and no kidding there. And uh, uh, geophysics and astrophysics. And uh, from the point of view of mathematics, uh, here is a long list of people, but not complete list of people, who have contributed to this problem. Now you'll see that besides Stokes in, in uh, 1880, I mean, from the last name, you can realize they're all Russians. And so there was a lot of study, some of them good friends. Uh, the, uh, a, lot of the, a lot of this work has been done by Russians at the time when there was this famous uh, competition between the United States and Russia to, you know, to throw satellites in, uh, in the orbit and re-entry of spacecrafts. So uh, probably there is a kind of... Uh, classified American literature about, the project, about this problem, about this, this kind of problems. But I only could find, uh, you know, Russian literature. Okay, so, uh, and by the way, this last one, Kovacheski and Skrein, is a very nice book <clears throat> where some of the problems are treated in a rigorous way. Okay, so, however, we're interested in, for the moment, we're interested in mathematics of the problem. So if you go through these papers that I just mentioned, that there are plenty, really plenty of those papers, then you see that there is really no result on which you can bet your life, really, no one. There is either an approximation or there is a simplification of the equations or there is an approximation. When I say approximation, I mean in the model. So there is approximation of the model or simplification of the equations or both. And so you wonder uh, if these problems are really uh, I mean, these results are really satisfactory, or there is something that has not been uh, seen, something that has been, unfortunately, uh, put on the side because the model was, was not correct, or the equations were not correct. Okay, so, uh, in order to understand which kind of problems I'm talking about more in details, so let's write the equation of motion of this coupled system. So, body plus liquid. I will explain the, uh, the symbols in, in a moment even though uh, they should be, in principle, clear. So, uh, well, the first equation, I think I can use it. At least as a pointer, I can use it. Okay, so, here, where is it? There. Okay, so, uh, this is, these are the Navier-Stokes equations. You may recognize the first two equations are the Navier-Stokes equations, with a little modification, because we are, we are writing them now in a body-fixed frame, okay? So these are the boundary conditions. That means that the velocity of the liquid has to be equal to the velocity of uh, the, the rotating velocity of, of the body. So this is just the uh, adherence conditions. And this is the, let's say, the modified Euler equation because now uh, the, 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 the body is no longer free. Uh, I mean, uh, you have a right hand side which from the physical point of view represent the torque acting by the fluid on the, on the body. Okay. So, uh, now the symbols, more details. So this C that you see up there, that C that you see up there, I can see it, but I can't, it's not being, whatever. You see the C that it's in red. That's the cavity, okay? So it's about the domain from the mathematical point of view. And then uh, this V, capital V, that is a coefficient in the Navier-Stokes equation, is the relative velocity of the liquid. And, uh, and the T, well, T is the usual Cauchy stress tensor. Uh, another important thing is that this analysis that I'm making only works if I use Navier-Stokes equations. 
just then I was talking compressible Aristotle's equations. I will come back to this later, but I don't know. And that's why I said it's basically a, 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 a virgin territory, an unexplored territory. There are so many things to be done here to see if the main effects remain the same. Okay, so these are the equations that we're interested in. At this point, the first thing we did was to do a very simple numerical analysis, numerical tests. So see, let's see what happens. Let's do so that we can have an idea of probably what is the mathematics that we have to use in order to show these results that you don't know yet, of course, because I didn't tell you. Okay, so uh, the, the numerics is done with the body that is in the shape of, a, uh, of an ellipsoid with an ellipsoid uh, cavity, so it's an ellipsoidal shell. And uh, uh, the, um, the, what, what this E sub i are the eigenvectors of the central inertia tensor of the whole system. So I use as a base the direction of the, uh, of the uh, eigenvectors of the inertia tensor of the whole system. And by omega i, I don't know the components of the angular velocity. So let's see this numerical test. So here is omega and its component versus time. So we are just seeing what happens to this body that is rotating with the water inside it, okay? The viscosity is 10 to the minus one in some, uh, uh, in some scale. Okay, so this is what happens. So you see that uh, after a little, let's say, chaotic motion, which lasts around uh, 50 uh, uh, time units, then everything stabilizes. Uh, stabilizes, you can see that the first component uh, which started from zero, so the omega one goes to zero. The omega two goes to zero as well, and the omega three goes to a non-zero value, constant value, okay? Of course, we, we have to expect that because we have conservation of uh, angular momentum. So if two of the components go down, the other has to go up to preserve the total angular momentum. So there is no surprise. Okay, so another experiment. Now we decrease the viscosity. So the liquid is still viscous, but the viscosity is very small. And uh, so we, do, we, we first go in the, same, in the same time span that we used the before, so it's up to 200 time units. And here there is something more complicated happening. So you see that, uh, well, this omega-2, it, it tends to go down, starts from 6.5, it tends to go down. So the motion around the, the second axis seems to go to zero, but there is an amplification in the other two, the other two components. So the motion becomes more chaotic, let's say I'm using chaotic in a kind of loose way, and uh, for the same time that we used before, same time spent. So you see, well, there is, I don't see any stabilization here, really. But in fact, as you may expect, is because the viscosity is very small. So if we go on a time interval, that is five times the one that we used before, you see that after this huge oscillation, eventually you do have stabilization again. So you see that uh, the second component is going to zero, the third component is going to some value, and uh, the first component is going again to zero. So uh, what we see is that uh, the, this body with the, the cavity filled with the liquid eventually seems to go to a constant rotation, right? Because two components are dying and one is surviving. So just, I mean, of course I presented only, you know, few samples, we made uh, hundreds of tests. And I picked the, the, the you know, the, those were more interesting. So the numerical test, they suggest the following. The, so the final dynamics of the coupled system is a uniform rotation. So there is this stabilization that I uh, told you at the beginning. And they also suggest that not only do we have a constant rotation, but that this rotation occurs along the axis where the moment of the inertia is larger. So I give you a, a picture. So if you take a, a can of tuna fish and you fill it with water, then if this is, for instance, the initial uh, uh, rotation, then the final rotation will be this one here. So, because the moment of inertia around that axis is a maximum. And vice versa, if you take uh, a, a can of, uh, of Coke, of soda, and you do the same thing, the final rotation has to be this one here. Okay? So, it depends on the shape. Depends, of course, on where 
these three axes, the three axes of inertia, are, uh, uh, are located. Okay, so this is the one information that we get. So, again, summarizing, we see that in general, the presence of a cavity that is entirely filled with a viscous liquid stabilizes the motion, so brings it to a uniform rotation. And no matter what the initial conditions are, I mean, numerically speaking, of course, the, uh, the, the couple system goes to a rigid rotation. And now, going back in the literature, you find this conjecture of Zhukovsky. Zhukovsky is the Kata Zhukovsky theorem, Ranga Kata Zhukovsky. I mean, Kata Zhukovsky. So, Zhukovsky in 1885, this is a, a literal translation that I asked one of the, our students, the Russian students, to perform for us. So, the conjecture says the following that whatever the shape of the body and of the cavity, and no matter what the initial movement of the body and the liquid, the system will eventually reach a state where it rotates as a whole rigid body with a constant angular velocity. So this one here was formulated in a very long paper of, by Zhukovsky in 1885. And uh, he gives, of course, a proof of this conjecture. In, you know, he doesn't call it a conjecture. He, he calls it a theorem. And if you go in the Russian literature, you will find that this is always quoted as Zhukovsky's theorem, even though there is no proof. There is just, a, you know, a, a, I mean, some algebra, of course, clever algebra, but still, uh, you know, nothing substantial. So the first thing as mathematicians we we're interested in uh, was, you know, now I'm with the head of mathematician. I was using the head of the engineer. Now the head of my mathematician. So the first thing is that can we prove this conjecture in a rigorous way? And so the, uh, let, let me first give a, a, a mathematical formulation of this, con of this conjecture. So it, it is very easy because it's exactly the equations that uh, I wrote a moment ago. So the Navier-Stokes equations the Euler equations, and then all we have to show is that the velocity u of the liquid tends to a rigid motion, which is a rotation. So this is what is written in the, in the left part of the last line, of the bottom line. And this omega t, the angular velocity, has to tend to a constant. So it's very simply formulated. That's what we have to do. If we prove this in a certain class of functions, of course, then we have proved Zhukovsky's conjecture. So, uh, just as a kind of uh, spoiled, uh, <laughs> spoiled alert, is that, uh, uh, spoiler alert, uh, so, what, what, what is, so the problem is still open. So, I, I leave one case that is open. However, as I will show you, I have experimental evidence that that case can be proved. Okay, experimental, not numerical uh, evidence. This, this will be the last, I mean, shown later. Okay, so I want to study this problem. I want to see if this is really the case. So those equations are written in a way that from the physical point of view is not very appealing. I mean, of course, navier stokes equations are always appealing. I made my living out of the navier stokes equations. How can I say that uh, they are not appealing? They are appealing and necessary. So uh, let me write the equations in this form. So I introduced this relative velocity. We already introduced before the relative velocity. Uh, G star will be the center of mass of the whole system. And the I is the inertia tensor of, again, the whole system with respect to G star. So this is the central uh, tensor of inertia. Okay, so then the equations can be written in equivalent form as follows. There is a dissipative component that is given by the Navier-Stokes equations, modified by Navier-Stokes equations. And there is a conservative component. That's what makes the thing more interesting and therefore more difficult. So there is a conservative component that is the angular momentum. So the angular momentum of the whole system has to be preserved, right? Because there are no forces, no torques in this case. So here, since we are in a frame attached to the body, we are not saying that the angular momentum is, uh, the total angular momentum is conserved, only the magnitude of the angular momentum. So in principle, if you think for a second, you can have turbulence. Because if you give a very large angular momentum, the whole system is going to keep it for the rest of its life. 
So it's not a problem where you have a clear dissipative effect. Or at least, you want the dissipative effect to prevail and be strong and bring everything to a uniform rotation. But this is not clear at the beginning, and you will see when we will go more into the mathematics, also mathematical is not completely clear. Okay, so, uh, first objective. First objective, you want to determine the ultimate dynamics. So what happens when t goes to infinity? Okay, so, uh, first thing, weak solutions. So let's put ourselves in the more gen most general class we, we know about Navier-Stokes. So we introduce a class of weak solutions also for this problem here. In fact, the weakness part of the solution is not the only equation. These are nice equations. The weak, the weak part comes only from, uh, from the Navier-Stokes side. So uh, this is basically nothing but a generalization of the classical hopeful array uh, weak solution class. So the velocity has to be divergence free and have the L2 space time regularity plus the, uh, the dissipation has to be in uh, L2 for all times. Uh, as you see, the angular velocity is, is, is good. It's in W1 infinity, W is a subless space, so basically it's, it's, it's nice. And this is the other important thing that we require, that, uh, uh, you know, one of the main open problems for Navier-Stokes is whether or not weak solutions satisfy the energy balance. That is not known, it's a you know, long-standing problem. Okay, but they do satisfy a kind of uh, uh, energy dis uh, unbalance, which is the strong energy inequality. So strong energy inequality for this problem is written exactly in, in this way. It uh, looks to be complicated that look, if you look at it, but in fact it's just a, a con uh, inequality. Instead of, uh, you take the energy balance and instead of the equality sign, just take uh, an inequality sign. So that's what you get. Okay. so. Uh, where exactly, this is the total energy. Again, you might not recognize because of the, of the uh, terms involved, but that really is it's not, it's not important. So that's the kinetic, the, the total kinetic energy. What is important is that, as expected, this is positive definite. Uh, that's clear. So in the variable, important variables, which are velocity and, uh, and, and rotation. Okay, so with this in hand, you can prove quite easily uh, the existence of uh, a weak solution. And uh, the only requirement is that the initial data, they have to have a finite energy. So from the physical point of view, think of this, that whenever I set my system in a finite energy mode initially, I can find uh, uh, the solution to this problem in a very general class, which is the class of weak solutions. Okay. And this is the first caveat, that weak solutions need not be unique. So you must keep in mind that uh, you want to deal with weak solutions because it's a general class. You would like to prove this conjecture in a general class. Then you have to deal with the fact that weak solutions are not unique. Then you may say, I want to be in a strong class. Okay, so to yourself. But then you have small data, and that is not nice. So we would like to have it in a very general class where, in principle, we don't have uniqueness. Okay, so uh, that's another routine thing. You want to go for T to infinity, so you want to know what happens, you study the omega limit set. So you define the omega limit set in uh, the most natural way, so V in L2, the sigma means divergence free and zero normal component of the boundary. Uh, P is a point, P is not pressure, P is a point in R3, and so you define in a natural way the, the omega limit set in this way, that basically is approached in L2 by the velocity field. and. Uh, in, uh, in the Euclidean norm by the angular velocity. That's, that's easy. Okay. Uh, another caveat, which is related to the one I told you before, uh, we don't know if these weak solutions are unique. So the omega limit is not just uh, depending on the initial conditions that you are prescribing, but depends on the whole solution. Okay, because we don't know if there is uniqueness. Okay, so first lemma. This lemma is very nice and in fact physically makes a lot uh, of, uh, of sense. So you take any weak solution, any weak solution according to the definition I gave before, then you can tell that this omega limit corresponding to this weak solution is zero, so velocity is zero. So the fluid goes to rest. And uh, A is where the 
ultimate really motion occurs because the, the fluid is at rest. So A is, uh, I mean, the motion of the, of the rigid body is responsible for that A. So A uh, is a compact connected subset of R3 uh, that is left invariant by the same group associated to the Euler equation. But not only that, of course, it has to preserve the initial angular momentum that we gave. Okay, so this, the, uh, the A is uh, left invariant by any W satisfying these conditions. Okay, so let's say in other words, what does this mean? So this means that uh, asymptotically, the system moves uh, uh, with, in, in the sense of a solution to the Euler equation. So it has to be a rigid motion, okay? So, because, so mathematically, this means that asymptotic manifold is a solution set. So it's a subset of all possible solutions to the Euler equation. Uh, however, uh, we don't want uh, this. This is not enough. In order to show Zhukovsky's conjecture, we have to show that this is just a single tone. That not, not just, uh, uh, we know, I mean, physically it's clear, if the velocity goes to zero, then the whole system has to move as a rigid body, right? But is this, uh, therefore, satisfy the Euler equation? But will the solution to the, to the Euler equation be exactly a uniform rotation? This is not clear, requires more investigation. So uh, the investigation is, let's investigate further the structure of the omega limit set, but in the set of, uh, in the class of weak solutions, where again, we don't have uniqueness, and so we cannot apply the usual, the usual thing. Okay, so very briefly, uh, if, uh, uh, just to give you the, the lemma that we are using, so if uh, uh, W denotes a weak, so WT, W0 denotes a weak solution corresponding to initial data W0, uh, it, um, we say that omega S is positively invariant if uh, I start from omega S and I stay in omega S for all possible weak solutions starting from Y. I say all possible because I don't have weak, so I don't have uniqueness. So I can have many, more than one. Okay. Uh, lemma. Uh, lemma is the following. If, uh, assume that I have a weak solution and that this weak solution, the particular one I'm looking, I mean, whose omega limit set I'm looking for, I'm trying to describe. So I take this weak solution and assume that there exists some time, possibly sufficiently large, where I have the uniqueness property, so the same group property, only for t large, and the continuous dependence, only for t large, then I can definitely conclude, and this is very simple to prove, that omega is positively invariant. So basically, if the weak solution becomes uh, strong for large t, then the omega limit set is positively invariant. Okay, this is exactly what I'm saying here. Question, does every weak solution become strong for sufficiently large times? Okay, at this point, uh, those of you who know Navier-Stokes uh, uh, very well, which means 101% uh, of you, they know that uh, uh, for Navier-Stokes, this is a trivial property. I mean, this is something that has been proved uh, uh, more than half a century ago. So weak solutions to the Navier-Stokes equations, they definitely become, of course, subject to forces which are small in size, they eventually become strong. So if I take any Navier-Stokes weak solution to the Navier-Stokes equations, I apply a force and this force is small, then the solution becomes strong for large t. Uh, actually, in, in, in this formulation goes back to Larry. Uh, and uh, uh, for, 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 the, for the Cauchy problem. So it's a very, very well-known property. Okay, but here we have this possibility of turbulence in general. So in other words, we do have that the angular, initial angular momentum is very large, can be arbitrarily large and conserved. So the problem of uh, reproving the same thing for, Navis, for, for this coupled system is not completely clear. However, uh, you know, again, we think a little bit and then we prove this lemma. Uh, all the proofs are given in the references that uh, I will you know, present at the end of this talk. So 
the lemma says, well, yes, it happens exactly like in Ivers Stokes equations. So you take uh, the cavity, which is sufficiently regular, and then uh, after a certain time, well, you have that the V is continuous uh, in the dissipation space as two spatial derivatives, uh, the time derivatives, the, pre the pressure is, uh, is fine, and omega is even better than for a weak solution. So yeah, the answer is yes, we do have regularity for large T. So at this point, we can say that this omega set is invariant. Okay, why is this important? Because we will, uh, in this way, we will uh, uh, restrict the class of possible motions on the, on the omega limit set. Remember that we want to end up with just one motion, one motion around one axis. So we have to make, uh, to, to, have, to get as much information as possible to get there. Okay, so uh, as you see, the dynamics on the omega limit set, we know already that V is equal to zero always, is left invariant by what we just proved. So uh, the, uh, uh, the dynamics reduces to this very simple problem here. So we knew the right hand side, or, uh, the, I mean the second equation, we know already the, the other equation, we knew that, that on the, the omega limit set that equation has to be satisfied. But the further information we have is that uh, this, uh, the omega dt cross x should be equal to grad b. And that is an extremely important information. Because if you take the curl of that equation, then, and uh, you coupled with the, the equation, the other equation, then you end up after simple algebra, really simple algebra, undergrad algebra, that uh, the solutions to that problem, to those two combined equations, it has to be necessarily constant. So there is an omega bar in R3, and not only has to be uh, such that the angular velocity is this omega bar, and not only that, but we also have that this omega bar has to be a proportional to, I mean, parallel to an eigenvector of uh, the inertia tensor, right? Because omega cross, omega bar cross i dot omega bar is to be equal to zero. So this rotation has to happen around one of the three axes, okay? And also this rotation has to be such that it has to preserve the initial energy and the uh, the magnitude of the initial angular momentum. So here we say, as a result, the set A contains all possible constant rotations, satisfying those properties. The question is that we want this A to be a single tone. We don't want all possible solutions to the, to, 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 to the, to the uh, all possible constant rotations. We just want to select one. Okay, so, uh, a further refinement. So uh, now let, let me call lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3 the eigenvalues of I, the central inertia tensor of uh, the whole system, okay? From the physical point of view, lambda 1, lambda 2, and lambda 3 are the moment of inertia calculated with respect to the three axes E1, E2, and E3. And uh, E1, E2, and E3 are the normalized eigenvectors. Okay, so let's consider the first case. So assume that the, the eigenvalues are distinct, lambda 1, lambda 2, and lambda 3. So basically the, pro, the, 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 the body doesn't have any mass symmetry, roughly speaking, quote unquote. So our stone, that is an example where basically there is no mass symmetry, so these three eigenvalues are distinct. So you can prove the following. You prove that uh, the, the refinement, that omega s, so the, the omega limit, is zero times A. But A is either a plus or minus gamma 1 E1 or a plus or minus gamma 2 E2 or plus or minus gamma 3 E3 where the gamma I are given at the top. So in such a way that the angular momentum is conserved. Okay, but uh, we know that uh, A is connected. So if it is connected, it cannot be one piece in one, one piece in another place and one piece in another place. So A has to be one of those. So what we can conclude is that if C is of class C2 and blah, 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 and we start with the finite kinetic energy and the eigenvalues are distinct, necessarily any weak solution corresponding to those data they, they has, to converge, has to converge to a constant angular velocity. And the velocity of the fluid has to be zero. So the final motion is a rotation around uh, one of the three 
inertia axis. So this problem, this theorem one, proves Zhukovsky's con conjecture in the case of distinct eigenvalues. So again, to give you a pictorial representation. So this is the stone, okay? So we take the stone, this assumes that these are the three axes representing the central axis of inertia of the stone and the water, so the coupled system, and that is the initial, uh, uh, I mean, the constant angular momentum. So uh, this is at t equals zero, then we will have only three choices according to the theorem for t going to infinity. Either rotation around one, or rotation around two, or rotation around three. There is no more. That's the only thing that this stone can do if, uh, uh, with the with the with with the with the, uh, uh, with the cavity filled with the viscous liquid. And uh, okay, so now this is another important question. Okay, theorem one says it goes around one of these axes. Remember that we don't have uniqueness. So what can happen, um, physically strange, is that you choose one initial condition and goes to one rotation around one axis. Now the same initial condition, there is another solution because it's not unique in principle, so the same goes to another axis if you don't have uniqueness, right? So in principle, this could, what could happen. Now the next theorem ensures that this is not the case. This is not the case. What really matters basically are which initial data we are using and not the how many solutions for those initial, uh, are emerging from those initial data. So again, uh, if lambda one is lambda two is, lambda, is less than lambda three, so basically this theorem says that everything goes to the central axis of inertia with larger moment of inertia. Now, this is not surprising physically if you think for a second, because the, 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 the axis with the larger inertia will have the least motion. So in other words, if there are no forces at all, zero, acting on, the, so forget gravity, okay? So the natural state of uh, this, uh, this uh, thing, well, the natural state, well, uh, it, well, we have to be in a frame, uh, otherwise Newton will be very unhappy. But if, uh, uh, so, so if, the, let us put it this way, feeling-wise, the stone tries to go to a state where the energy is a minimum. Right, where the motion is a minimum, forgive me, where motion is a minimum. There is very little state of motion, okay? And so this is realized if it goes to that axis where the inertia is larger. So the motion is a minimum, because eventually it has to move, there is, because there is conservation of angular momentum. So if it has to move, it will go to the axis where the motion is minimal. Okay, so now two or more eigenvalues coincide, and this is the case where the, the thing is not clear completely, but still we have some, some, as I said, I have experimental evidence that I will show you later. So assume that lambda one is equal to lambda two, and uh, lambda uh, three is neither lambda one nor lambda two. Of course, they are the same. Okay, so assume this situation here. So now remember that we have to show that A is a single tone. So we either, in this situation, we either have that A is a single tone and the rotation occurs along that uh, lambda three, so the third axis, uh, with of course a coefficient that is conserv uh, conserves the, the angular momentum, or, and this is the, the, the second thing that can happen, that uh, in principle A is contained in a manifold. So we cannot single out just one rotation. And on a manifold that of course uh, preserves uh, the total angular momentum. So this is the right case that we would like to investigate in more details. And the situation seems to be even more complicated if uh, the three eigenvalues coincide. So in the simplest case, think of a sphere, homogeneous sphere, with the cavity right in the center, which is also in the shape of a sphere. And so uh, the, uh, we can say still very little about this, uh, this A because it's contained uh, uh, in principle on the surface of a sphere that preserves the angular momentum. Okay, so uh, we need further information. Uh, okay, let me give you briefly further information. So uh, we, we see something that is very simple. Uh, is the following. We take the linear momentum equation for the Navier-Stokes equations, just the linear momentum, and uh, you know, by doing a little Schwartz inequality, that's it, you end up with the, the fact that omega, the difference between omega at two different times, whatever this omega is going to be, is bounded by the quantity on the right hand side. So 
uh, if we show uh, that the energy goes to zero, something that we already know, because we proved that the energy goes to zero, the, the energy of the liquid goes to zero, and uh, this other information, that V, uh, from the mathematical point of view, is in L1 in time, so the energy is L1 in time, then uh, you show easily, of course, trivially, that there exists some uh, omega bar where the angular velocity is converging to. So if these two properties are true, then necessarily A has to be a single tone. Okay, so uh, we, 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 we show this lemma that if uh, lambda 1 is equal to lambda 2 but is less than lambda 3, so if you want to picture this with an example thing of a tuna can, that is this case, T1, lambda 1 is equal to lambda 2 less than lambda 3, a tuna can, then uh, if, uh, at this we proved, uh, A is contained in that set, necessarily the energy has to decay exponentially fast. And so if decay is exponentially fast, and the same absence if lambda 1 is equal to lambda 2 is equal to lambda 3. So if lambda 1 is equal to lambda 2 less than lambda 3, like a tuna can, or if lambda 2 is equal to lambda, two, lambda 1 is equal to lambda 2 is equal to lambda 3, like a sphere, like a ball, then we have this exponential decay. And so we can conclude the following. So C of class C2, and either the eigenvalue satisfy that property, so the moment of inertia satisfies satisfy that property, or the second one, uh, then necessarily we can say the same thing we said before. So Zhukovsky conjecture is true, and the omega bar is uniquely determined. So now it is not known, so that's what is left open. Uh, if, uh, so we are in the case of uh, a soda can, that uh, lambda 2 is equal to lambda 3 greater than lambda 1, is that true that uh, uh, we have the, the conjecture continues to hold? We don't know. However, as I said, I have a, an experiment that uh, an experiment that I've done in, in my lab with other graduates. So uh, this this experiment has been run by Jacob uh, and Greg in our department in my lab, and so this is what the the thing is. So it's a gyroscope. It's basically a gyroscope. The, uh, how do I turn this on? Is there anything I, I can push here to turn this on? Okay. So anyway, you see the cylinder right in the middle, right? So the cylinder is basically the, 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 um, the soda can that I was telling you, and it's filled with the liquid. And the, the, the two frames are hinged in such a way that in principle the soda can can rotate in all possible directions, okay? So here is this movie, two movies that I would like to show you. So this is done, this first experiment is just with water. So these are very, so it's, uh, as I said, there are these two frames that are hinged in a special way that in principle this, this thing can rotate the way it, want, it wants. So there is a drill and the drill will uh, turn the, uh, the, the, the can, I mean the, the cylinder, in, uh, along uh, its major axis. And uh, uh, the, you know, the drilling will uh, last something like 20 seconds, I guess, in this experiment. And the, 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 the cylinder will reach something like uh, several thousands RPM. So it's really spinning very, very fast, okay? And then the drill is removed and you will see what happens. Okay, so what if, uh, let's say, Joukowsky's conjecture is true, or if the theorem we want to prove is correct in principle, then what you obtain, what you should observe is that the cylinder that originally is rotating around uh, its major, its longer axis, in fact, we rotate around the shorter axis, which is orthogonal, which is in this direction here. Okay, and so let's see what happens. And we, you will also notice one other thing, that in fact, this is what is going to happen, otherwise I will not show it to you. So this is what is going to happen, but you will see also another thing, that the time that the cylinder takes to go to that rotation is very large. Now you say, what do you mean very large? Well, large compared to the next experiment that I will show you, where it will be just like that. And the reason is viscosity. So let's start with water. Okay, so it's thousands of RPM now. And the rotation is in this direction here, as you'll see. Soon they will release the the frames. You 
She is chaotic now. And you see eventually the rotation, well, unfortunately, the, the movie, I don't know why it's not good now, but the rotation is eventually around that axis. Please keep in mind that we are, there is air around, so the whole process is also delayed by the air. But I don't know why it's so, yeah. Okay, so this is glycerin. And it's a little bit longer, so it's uh, just to see uh, the time that it takes to go to the final rotation. I don't know why it's so... It's not smooth. Weak solutions. Yeah. I saw it's kind of jerky. Because it's, it's beautiful. You will see that all, uh, despite all this spinning and turning, it goes to the uniform rotation really in a couple of seconds. Uh, this is because of glycerin. Well, you, yeah, you've seen it, uh, let's say, uh, yeah. But I mean, if you compare it with water, uh, oops, I'm sorry that is so, I don't know why, so jerky on my screen is not. But uh, so basically, it goes to that rotation in, uh, uh, we count that the average was less than a second, going from this very, very uh, fast spinning around the, the major axis uh, to the, uh, you know, to the, uh, to the final rotation. Okay, so I will be, now, uh, very, very quickly, in another minute, boy, in another minute. Uh, so what happens if I do the same thing with a pendulum? So now I take a pendulum very, very quickly, and uh, again, the same procedure, this is a sketch. So a pendulum and uh, two-dimensional, let's say, pendulum. Not two-dimensional in the sense that the body is two-dimensional, but that the motion happens in a plane. So fill the cavity with water and, uh, uh, and study by exactly by the same, uh, by the, I just want to give you the, the pictorial representation of what you can show rigorously analytical, from the analytical point of view. So that you start from some, uh, release the pendulum from a certain position that is not just the vertical. Well, whatever is the position that you are releasing this, this pendulum from, the final motion will be either this or this. And in particular, if uh, the energy is uh, sufficiently small, so for instance, if you really start from rest, then the final, the final, uh, the final motion will be the center of mass in the lower position. So the property that you get is this unforeseen property is basically that if you fill up a pendulum with a viscous liquid, eventually you get the same result as putting the pendulum in a viscous fluid. So eventually it will go to rest. And this is something that uh, uh, I find it, and I also have uh, you know, experiments, real experiments, not numerical experiments on this, is a lot of fun but uh, uh, I don't have time to show you. So, four interesting, in my opinion, open questions. So one thing that is not clear and is not known is just uh, the analysis, the mathematical analysis of uh, what happens between uh, the moment where the, rota the final rotation is obtained and uh, the time t equals zero. So in other words, the chaotic part of the motion is not studied, is not known, and it is not clear. Uh, the second is if these properties, they depend on the type of liquid. So if the liquid is viscoelastic or more general, uh, generalized and Newtonian or compressible, does it work? Does it happen? There is nothing that I know about, even from the you know, engineering point of view on it. Uh, the stabilizing property, if it is partially filled, that is another complicated problem to study. And, uh, and even more interesting and even more complicated is the case where the cavity is elastic. So if the cavity can deform, uh, does this uh, you know, help uh, act against the thing? So with all these four problems, I thank you again for your attention. I apologize for being a little bit late. Thank you.